Well, it is good to be in the house of the Lord tonight, isn't it? Yes, amen. After all the business that we had yesterday and last night, and we had all of our kids over, or most of them, and uh, having gifts and food and hearing the Lord when he was brought into this world, and uh, my daughter for 40 some odd years has been doing that every year for us, reading the book of Luke, quoting it. When she was about eight years old, they had to do that in Christian school. And uh, I said, all right, since you can quote it, then why don't you do it for your family first time? And she did, it shocked me. So anyway, that's been a, a Todd custom now. And uh, now she's in her 50s, but yet she's still doing it. And we thank the Lord for that. What a great privilege it is for me, <clears throat> and it really is, uh, to be in this pulpit, uh, to be in this church. Uh, you know, folks, we are honored uh, to have such a pastor as, and his dear wife uh, as we have here, as you have here. Because I know a lot of churches would give anything to have a pastor that would preach the word as it is to men as they are, quote as many scriptures as he does, and stays right on track. And uh, I, I'm jealous of him, really, uh, how he can do all of that. And he is younger than I am, so I guess I can give that to him. And uh, I think two years, three, whatever he said, we'll, we'll quote it that way. But isn't it, a, isn't it good to know the Lord? I'll tell you, that's, that's one of the most important things in the world, to know the Lord. I got saved when I was about 10 years old and uh, had no earthly idea, just a country boy, what God's going to do with us. But uh, it wouldn't change that day, and I remember it like it was yesterday when I got saved. And uh, when the Lord called us and into the ministry and all that, and I uh, had no earthly idea what the Lord's going to do for us, just stepping out by faith. And... Um, just letting the Lord use us. And that's exactly what we all ought to do. Just step out by faith and let the Lord use us. And we come to this time of Christmas and, and all the aspects of Christmas. And when you look over the two people that came or the two groups of people who came to, the, to his birth or thereafter, that I believe there was a specific reason. And I want to talk to you now about that. And uh, I guess we can say we can talk about the, the perfect gift. And the preacher talked quite a bit about it this morning uh, so adequately. Uh, but uh, I want you to turn your Bibles uh, tonight uh, to uh, first uh, we'll look in Luke and then uh, we'll go into Matthew. But you know, um, when we thought about Christmas and around our neighborhood, uh, we, several years ago, our kids gave us a Christmas gift. The big old box, about like this, and about four, four, four foot square, about that thick. So what on earth was in there? And so we, um, uh, my turn to open up a gift, so I opened it up. And I looked in there, and there's a bunch of white boards in it. I thought, well, these kids, no telling. And so I started drawing some stuff out, and here came a Y, a big old white Y, the letter Y. And then after a while, here came... I pulled another stick out, and here came a big old J. And I thought, what on earth? And then there's one more left in there, and it was a big old O. Joy, four feet high. Oh, this wide when you put them there. But in the center of the O, they had cut out a form of the nativity scene. And there's Mary. There's a little crib. There's... Uh, the Lord in the crib, and then here's Joseph inside that little O, the big O. And we put that in our yard ever since, put a light on it and so forth. And then uh, my son-in-law is a social pastor of church, and they, they built some little cribs as a, for their school, had the kids to do it. So they gave me one of those, and so I had a little crib then to put beside this. And then we found a sign this year that said, uh, Christ the Savior is born. And so I, I, we bought that, and I said, we, we'll, we'll put that somehow on, on all of this whatever. 
And we put that sign on the back of that crib and it fit exactly, perfectly. Christ, the Savior, is born. So we put that up, put lights on it. And I couldn't wait in our community, we live in Howie, to see the different, direct, uh, different uh, uh, displays of Christmas. And I just couldn't wait to see. And we had that, put some other things up, lights and all that. But as we began to drive around and looked right of media across the street and all that, uh, there was, oh, here was a Santa Claus, and there's a snowman, here's some reindeers, here's a this, here's a that, and all, everything. And there for about two or three weeks, there was nothing that depicted why we're celebrating Christmas. Nothing about the Lord, nothing. Finally, two or three in our neighborhood finally put something up and uh, there are some other nativity scenes and things of that nature. But I began to think about that, how that we have Christmas in a Christian nation that's celebrating the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and we are so far removed from that until it's totally ridiculous. Yeah. We're losing sight of what we're really serving Christmas about. Yeah. It's no longer about Christ, it's about a Christmas tree. And I don't know what a Christmas tree is. I looked at the tree that we have, and it's a pine tree. Then we put Christmas on it, and so forth. But just think that around our country, more people are more excited about Santa Claus than they are about the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's a sad thing. It really, really is. But we know the real meaning of Christmas. And I want you to turn, if you would, please, and, and turn to Matthew, first of all. And um, I want you to look in chapter 2 and just going to look at uh, one, one verse in Matthew chapter 2. And let's pray before we go. Father, we thank you now. Before we get into the word, I pray your will be done. Help me, Lord. Give us therapy, a complete therapy of, of, thought, of, of thought, Lord. And I pray, Lord, we'll just honor your precious name. Thank you for what you're going to do for us tonight. Help us to lean totally upon thee and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. And for his sake, amen. Look, if you would, in, in Matthew chapter 2 and in, in just verse 11, it says that when they came into the house, this is talking about the kings, or not the kings, but the wise men, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. What a unique verse. What uh, uh, these people who came. Flip over, if you would, to Luke chapter 2. And Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 and verse 16. There was a wise man came, and they went to Herod first of all. And he said, go find wherever this king is, because he's not here in Jerusalem. And uh, they were directed to go then to Bethlehem. And there they saw baby Jesus. Then in Luke chapter 2, it says, And they came with haste and found Mary. Now these are the shepherds that was in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night, and all of a sudden an angel came. You know the story. And uh, they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Notice this now. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child, the information they had received. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. When we look at these verses and, and think about it, that um, uh, there's so much that we kind of overlook, I guess it is. And as we look in, at these verses, we find that the shepherds came and um, they had very little. Uh, they left their flocks. They came to uh, the, where in Bethlehem, where baby Jesus was. Uh, they worshiped him, and um, then they, they left. And then later on, the kings came, as we just read here. And uh, it's amazing how the kings came with their gold and frankincense and myrrh and gave this to uh, this family. And we just look at these two groups of people, how the difference in why they came 
and what they did. Look at the shepherds, first of all, when we uh, think of the, the shepherds, uh, that they came with very little. They, they didn't have much. Uh, they were just keepers of sheep. And all of a sudden, when the angel came, and they said, well, let's go see. I never shall forget, when we was in Israel several years ago, uh, we were driving in the bus, and, and all of a sudden, we pulled off, off the side, and, and the bus driver said, oh, wait, I want you to see this. I want you to see this. He said, look out over to the right. We was kind of a, a, kind of a valley-like thing. We was kind of up a little bit. And there was a bunch of sheep down there. And about in the middle of all these sheep, about four or five guys, come to find out there was a kind of a water uh, container down there. It's on a river or some kind of little stream. And they were watering their sheep. And the shepherds were down there just talking just like, you know, Baptists do and all that. And um, just having a, seemingly a good time. And he said, now watch, watch. And we, we, we watch. We, we seen the sheep do this, the shepherds doing that. And all of a sudden, one of them just started walking away. He said, now watch. Listen. Watch. Listen. And so he said, <laughs> something like that. And all of a sudden, some sheep started stirring and walking toward him. Another one made some more noise. And he started walking towards them. In each case, as they, the, per, the person left, and uh, the sheep began to follow. Well, we look at these shepherds, they, they were in that situation. But they left their sheep in order to go and find the shepherd and uh, the real shepherd. And we know that in doing this, they turned their back to the things of the world, uh, even their only livelihood. They literally gave of themselves to go see this that had been done uh, there in Bethlehem, there at the, at the manger. And then when they came and, and found this baby Jesus, it was a miracle. Some wonderful things had taken place. And as we read in the scriptures there, that uh, they, as they went, uh, they began to tell the story. And that story began to go, and no telling how far it went. And then as we look at the wise men, so it was rather strange. Here we have the lowly shepherds, and then we have the wise men. The wise men were very popular in some aspects. Wise men, wise men had about anything they needed. They were very rich people. And here they come looking for this same baby because they saw something in the clouds. They saw a star that had not been there before. And they've been astrologers, I guess, and looking into the sky. And all of a sudden they see this strange thing. And it began to move and it began to lead. And they said, well, let's go see this thing. And you know, as they came, as we read in the scripture there, as they came to, to Bethlehem and they found uh, Joseph, they found Mary, then they found baby Jesus. And oh, they were excited. Of course, they went through Herod and Herod said, you come and tell me where he is because he had some other plans. But the angel warned them and they fled away and did not go back to Herod and uh, talk to him about it because he would have had them killed because wasn't long until after that the babies of two years and younger were, were killed. Then we look at that and see that before they left, they did a, a, a marvelous thing. They left to this family, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. We know the story. We begin to think about that. Here's the shepherds. They had very little. They came, and yet they were able to tell other people, many people, it says in the scripture, here the wise men came. It didn't say much about how much they talked about people, but it's amazing what they were able to give to the family. In an amazing way how God takes care of us, how God supplies all of our needs, how that with the shepherds there was what they needed. They needed that comfort. They needed that, that assurance. And um, they needed the news that a babe had been born. And as the shepherds went back, the message began to grow and we begin to spread. But then all of a sudden, uh, Herod realized what had happened, so he's gonna slaughter all the children. And Mary and Joseph are here, what are they gonna do? They've traveled so far, had very little, what are they gonna do? But God had a plan, a very particular plan, and that is to send wise men into there where they are, think of that. And as he brought the wise men in there, and what did they do? Yes, they worshiped him, the Bible says, but they gave them the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What did they need? 
because the very next day God told them that night that you've got to get out of here because the babies are going to be, how on earth are they going to go? Just so happens they got three gifts. Just so happens gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, you, you know, you say, well, that was just an accident. No, it wasn't either. That's in the plan of God. But when I look at those things, it's amazing how that here in this couple, in their condition, just doing, being in Bethlehem, because it's a time for taxes and all that, and all of a sudden have a baby. And what are we going to do? What are we going to do? God had a plan, perfect plan. And he took everything, brought it to them, what they needed. They needed direction. They needed finances. And everything that God wanted them to do, he supplied everything for that. I look at that and see that story and just see the big picture of all what we just talked about. And I think of a church, our church, churches around this country. We're just needing somebody, some things, some people with uh, intelligence, spiritual insight, able to teach, able to sing, able to do many, many things in the body of Christ. And isn't it amazing how that God does supply all of those needs in, in the body of Christ. What a, what a blessing that is to know that we have people that can play the piano, people that can teach Sunday school class, people that then can cook since we're Baptists and have some good meetings out there and every once in a while, you know what I'm saying. What a blessing that is. But I wonder, if, uh, folks, as we think, kind of think about this, that in your own personal life, what have you allowed God to do with you? I mean, we're coming out of Christmas time now. Now we're just going to go into every humdrum stage of life. But you're still here. God has blessed you and I with life. What are we going to do as a body of believers, as just an individual as a believer? What has God put into your hands? What has God given you? What has God supplied you and me in order for we can contribute for the cause of the church? for our pastor, but most of all for the cause of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As the shepherds came and spread the news, that's what we need to do as individuals. As the wise men came and, and gave their finances, that's exactly what we need to do uh, here in, in the local uh, community, in the local church today. This is a perfect example uh, for us to let us be shepherds and let us be wise men so God's work can continue to go on. What would have happened to Joseph and Mary had those wise men not come and supplied with them the means for them to go uh, back into Egypt until finally Herod had been uh, killed or died? What would they have done? We don't know. But God had a plan. And the wise men answered God's plan not really knowing, not really knowing what it's all about. You know, it's amazing when we look at this story and we look at it over time and time again that we wonder about what, what the situation, what does it really tell us? It tells us this. There's a, there's a great verse <coughs> that's found in John chapter 3 and verse 16. You probably don't know it by heart, but I'll quote it anyway. When I think about this situation that we've tried to explain to you, that you already knew, but when I begin to look about God and his love for us, his love for us, that yes, 2,000 plus years ago, he did send that little baby. And he sent him for a purpose and for a reason. God, our Father, God, our Father, sent his son to this earth that it might die for us. Think of that for just a moment. Think of that. The Bible says that for God so loved the world. Oh, a perfect motive. Perfect motive in this situation. All about 55, 56 years ago, we find out that we was going to have a little girl. A little, I wanted a little boy, but God didn't want to do that. And so, uh, 
the pregnancy went along pretty good, except kind of at the end, and all of a sudden, uh, it was time for this little supposedly boy to be born. And so uh, everything went pretty good and so forth and so on. And, and all of a sudden, uh, uh, we realized, as it said, well, we won't be able to go home. It said, we're going to have to keep the baby for two or three days. It said, well, what's the matter? It said, well, we've got something that's uh, very, very new. In fact, he said this, had, had this baby been born five years ago, we would not have known what this is all about. We couldn't know what, we didn't know what to do. She had a blood disorder, blood, something wrong with the blood system. And so they said, we're going to change the blood and see how it goes. By then, my wife had come home, and we waited a little while, and they said, we're going to change the blood one more time and see how things are. And we came back, and at 4.30 that morning, they're supposed to have a blood change, and the nurse overlooked it. So what on earth is going to happen now? We thought maybe we was going to lose Leanne, but God had a plan. God had a purpose. And sure enough, the doctor came out and handed us that little old baby girl, and now she's got two precious grandsons working in the church, doing real well. And I looked at that and think that God is the giver of life. God provides for us in every way. And so we look as, as these shepherds and as these wise men come, that God will supply. But God said, and the scripture says, for God so loved. I don't think I could love a baby any more than what anybody can, like I did a Leanne, any more. But then when I read that scripture, it says uh, the right motive for God so loved. Just think of that, that God loves you and me. How much? Oh, so bountifully, so wonderfully, so marvelously loved. Just think somebody loves you that's greater than anybody else. So loved. What a great and wonderful thing. So loved. I think of this, that, that the, if the Bible says it's just simply this, that because a perfect motive in that situation. But also he loves so much until he gave a perfect gift a perfect gift for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now think of that. I, I think we've quoted that verse probably more than any verse in the scripture. But have we really realized what God was doing? Do you realize what was really in God's heart? How was God feeling with his love that he extended to us? So much until he was willing to send his son to be born, yes, in Bethlehem, born of a virgin and all of that. But he did all of that for you and for me. For God so loved the world that he literally gave his son to come into this world for one reason and one reason only. To die for you and you and you and you. To die for me. If I was God the Father, I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if I wanted to do that. When we heard possibly that we might lose our daughter, it hurt. I mean, we cried, we, we prayed, we did just everything those two or three days until finally we got the news. But just think of what God did. He loved us so much until he said, I'm gonna send my son in form of a little baby. A little baby. And I'm gonna have that baby to be killed in time for my sin and your sin. Oh my, it's nothing but just a, a, a perfect gift. No greater gift than that, than that son of the, Lord and, of, of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. A great gift. We see this that it is for our sin. And when we ought to evaluate that somewhat. Not only was it a perfect mo uh, motive, but also a perfect gift. A perfect gift. You know, when we kind of give our life to the Lord and dedicate ourselves to, to, to the Lord, it's not perfect. It has to be worked on. It has to be improved. We got to, to spiritually uh, improve ourselves, grow in the Lord, be prayer warriors, to be uh, soul winners, to be tithers, to be church goers, and be soul winners so that we can go out and spread this glorious gospel. We have to be improved. But the gift that God gave us in his son was a very perfect gift.
Didn't have to be trained per se, because God knew everything, perfect in every way. What a blessing that is, that he gave his only begotten, that's all he had, his only begotten son. And then the real requirement, there's a requirement in this whole situation, because the birth of Jesus Christ is nothing but the foundation laid for men and women and boys and girls like you and me to be saved. What on earth is that, that only requirement? Just simply this, that whosoever believeth in him, that whosoever believeth in him, what a precious thing that is. That means anybody. We all know that. That means everybody. I'm glad, yes, when I was about 10 years old that I, that I heard the preacher preach and, and, and I walked the aisle and got saved. Oh, I'm glad I was in that, whosoever. You remember that time you got saved? How many remember the time you really got saved? Do you remember that? You remember when the preacher buried you and he kept you underwater for a little bit and you come up kind of gurgling somewhat or like that? It happens and so forth. But when you got saved, you just something, something marvelous, wonderful happened on the inside, outside, and you just want to tell everybody. Sins are all washed away. What on earth is that? Well, it's just simply this, that that's a great motive and so forth, but also that's the only requirement, that whosoever. Just think of that, whosoever. How powerful, how magnitude this thing is, that whosoever, doesn't matter how many, it could mean the whole world, the whole lifetime of the world, that that is so powerful that they can be saved and can be born again. That whosoever, the only uh, requirement, but the greatest reward, the greatest reward. Thank God that we have Christmas because this great reward we can have. And what is that? Shall not perish, but have everlasting life. See, Christmas is just the beginning of something. Christmas is the beginning of the price that had to be paid for my sin and your sin. I think when we think of this, that, that we ought to think of Christmas a little more serious. Take it a little bit more serious. Well, I know the, this morning as we came out, a uh, guy across the street, they had a lot of, they got a lot of decorations and so forth. Not Christmas at all, none at all. And we came out and he had two big dogs and he's walking them. We'd just gotten in the car and we went back and drove into the next street there and he was coming out of his property and we talk a little bit sometime. And we rolled down the window and Anna did and we said, Merry Christmas! And he said, Happy Holiday! I thought, yeah, mm-hmm. That says a lot, doesn't it? But you know what? I was going to church. Anna and I was coming to hear the gospel coming to hear the word, coming to hear that Christ has been born. He was out walking the dog, walking the dog. How a sad thing. And that's the way it is in the world even today. Oh, it's so sad. And it's getting worse, getting worse. Churches are losing ground today. But oh, thank God we've got a few. We've got some going to be steadfast, unmoving, always abounding in the work of the Lord because you know what? We're going to reap if we faint not. Think of that. Think of that. Be encouraged as a Christian. Be encouraging if you're an oddball. Be encouraged if some folks don't like you. Be encouraged if they don't like the way you talk and the way that you don't drink and smoke and do all whatever in this uh, ungodly world. Be grateful and thankful that you have that because it's the greatest reward that whosoever believeth him should not perish but have ever lasting life. What a joy that is. And all of this has been made possible because of the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What about that person that was born in a manger? Several things just real quickly. Listen. Listen. Christ is the way to salvation in Acts chapter 4. Christ is the way to the Father, John chapter 14. Christ is the way to service, John chapter 12. Christ is the way to the reward, John chapter 12. Christ is the way to true happiness, Ephesians 1. Christ is the way to eternal life, John 17. Christ is the way to the future home in heaven, Matthew chapter 25. And that was all wrapped up in that little old babe lying in a manger, that you and I might have eternal and everlasting life Trust him as our Savior. 
name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life and knowing one day we're going to hear the trumpet sound. If we don't, we're death is going to come and just our spirit's going to go sin back and right back into heaven. And what a wonderful time that's going to be. So as we look at the, what had happened in, in our text and so forth, that God used some shepherds, some shepherds to spread the word. They didn't have the means. They didn't have the finances. But God also used the wise men to come in and bring the finances so everything can be taken care of and Joseph and them can go to Egypt and come back later on and have their life going. And that somebody could be you, to be you, whatever it might be. You're here and I'm here still for a purpose and for a reason. Are you fulfilling that purpose? I mean, if there's something that God wants done and he wants you to do it, is there any way that you're in contact with the Lord in such a way that you can know what that is? Is there something that's tingling in your heart, a desire in your heart that you want to do something? You just seem like God is leading, God's directing somehow or another, and you, you just haven't turned it over yet? Just think that God gave his only son. I just think of God in heaven looking at that baby and thinking one day that body is going to be hanging on that old rugged cross. Think of a father thinking about that. But he loved us enough that he did it for you and for me. Oh, God help us, church. God help us in this new year. And now our pastor is going to challenge us, and no doubt about that. What can we do? Just say, lay aside the weight that so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race of 22 that's going to be before us. What are we going to do? What are you going to do? God help us to do and be what he wants us to be. Amen. Just a shepherd, wise person. Take our talents and abilities and use it to bring honor and glory to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad the shepherds win? Aren't you glad the wise men win? Fulfill the story of Christ. I wonder what story has not been told or written yet concerning my life, your life, because we're still living it. Are we living it the way God wants it to be lived? Are we doing exactly what God wants us to do? What slot in this church is empty because you haven't surrendered or dedicated? You haven't said, I'll do that. Lord, here am I, send me. Whatever you need, Lord, let me do it. Just open up a door for me. Oh, God, help us this coming year that we'll see souls saved, we'll see people baptized, and it's all, we can't, listen, we can't rely that and put that load all on the pastor. It's up to you and me as members of countryside here to be a witness to everywhere we go like the shepherds were, like the wise men were, and people came to the saving knowledge of the Lord. God help us today in this new year. Amen. Will you have your head bowed, please, for just a moment?